<laughs> well, hi all. How you how you doing this morning? Um, I uh, I thought I would get my my first dibs in for the first lecture of the year, just so I can partly to get it done, but partly because I actually like doing these things. So, how can I say? <coughs> I'm the oldest of oldest kid in a large family, so I guess that's part of why you know I mm -hmm. tend to show off a little bit sometimes. Um, but I one of the reasons I wanted to do this is because. Um, mm -hmm. Individuals had just been awarded the 2014 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for work that it really kind of speaks to me as a scientist because this is two generations of people. Um, among the three people who were awarded the Nobel Prize, um, two of them are a married couple uh, who happened to be postdocs in the laboratory of the third person. The third person was a, a senior faculty. He's, he's still doing research and his um, his most, you might say, seminal paper was published in 1971. The other two people, uh, their, their, again, the word seminal publications were in the middle 2000s, 2004, 5, 6. So um, part of what I like about it is that this really speaks to the way, you know, science isn't just about going to labs and doing things. Science is about training the next generation. That's really part of, of the whole thing because there's a continuum back to you know ancient times when people learned how to do things um, and it's been you know gradual improvements and knowledge grows and things that people once thought were the way life works the, the universe works would be discovered cast aside as more things come along and wherever this is is, uh, is gathered so you know at any any time you see something like this we have a little time frame of a few decades you know, it's a snapshot of, the, of the, the bigger picture, and I just think that that's kind of a refreshing thing to see. Um, but also, I love the topic, because the topic has to do with how our brains um, locate us in space and how we locate other things. And uh, in case any of you have ever forgotten where your keys are, um, this might strike home. Mm -hmm. And basically, what this will say is, always put your keys in the same place. So... Um, Welcome to space bar on that one. Okay, good. The Nobel Pri uh, Laureate said I mentioned a uh, guy named Simon from the University College in London. And what he did was very, very old fashioned to us these days uh, 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 neurophysiology experiments in, in uh, living rats. And he would, he would uh, basically cut a little burr hole in the rat's uh, skull and place electrodes in specific locations in the brain. And, and uh, the electrodes would record not from single cells, but hopefully small groups of cells in the brain. And of course, anatomy had been mapped out to a certain level of, of confidence. So he had a pretty good idea of where his electrodes were and um, what the cells were that he was recording. Um, and his, just to get you to the bottom line, he's the guy who <coughs> discovered what he called place cells. Place cells are cells that form a grid. In the, they're, they're found in the hippocampus in rats and also in humans. Um, probably all, all uh, mammal species. Um, but they are cells that tell you basically where you are in space. And um, you know, they help you to get oriented to things. The other group, the, the uh, married couple who were his postdoctoral people, are at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Uh, they um, were working with a different region of the brain that is just above the uh, hippocampus, the entorhinal cortex, which generates a coordinate system that learns where things are. So you have two coordinate systems that can allow you to find something. One of them tells you where, where you are, and uh, that's something that actually is set over a period of time with repeated learning. Something that says where things are and that's something that is set with much less frequent learning before that sets in. And it also, it also has a grid system, as you'll see the data demonstrate a grid system in both of these things. So it's really, it's really very interesting. And um, not to get too, too cartoony about it, but um, this system works so well that, you know, we all know how to get <coughs> home, but even this guy can get home. So <laughs> it just goes to show, and his, you can see his brain is quite small. <laughs> Um, now, I don't want to tell you that this is the end of the story, and it's never the end of the story in research, which is you know, one, of, one of the reasons people get into it, because there's always more to discover. Um, since, this, since these early studies, and actually sometimes concurrent with these studies, 
people have, um, have studied head direction cells. So you take an animal and have it pointed some way, different cells will be excited depending in which compass direction the animal is pointing. Um, there are cells that tell you what, what your proximity is to an environmental, bound an environmental boundary, like a wall or water or something like that. And there are also cells that can have multiple functions of both the direction you face and where you are. So it isn't just a really simple, you know, A does this, B does that. But um, this is clearly a work in process. So early, early in all of this, when O'Keefe was working in the 70s, he was sticking electrodes into, into a rat, rat's brain, and put the rat in a little box. And he wrapped the box on three sides so the rat couldn't see where it was. And he just had little marks identifying where around the box he would point the rat. So he's collecting, doing uh, single, a single electrode, collecting from a small group of cells. He knew where the electrode was. And, and so he was, uh, in this particular, with this particular electrode, where the trace is shown here, and these spikes show activity from the, from the electrode, in this particular electrode, when the mouse is pointed in this direction, you get a, a, a lot of spikes. And the mouse is rotated over to B, and he's holding the mouse. It's, it's alive. It's, you know, he's, he's good to his mice. And there's, a, there's somewhat less in, in that. And when he goes to, to D, he's recording while he's traversing from B to D. And he's getting a little bit of spike in C. Once he gets to D, 90 degrees, nothing. Nothing all the way around here. And then he tries a little experiment. He has the, route, the mouse turn around like this. And he flips it, um, flips it around and back again. And he gets a spike. That's the, he gets it around to its original A orientation and back. So he was able to um, go from no spikes to boop, 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 spikes to no spikes. And then return it to A again and you get spikes. So, and to give you some idea of the raw data he's working with, this is really pretty crude. This is a positive result happening at A. And this is when you don't see anything. So his background levels are really pretty noisy. Um, and to give you some idea of the kind of patience it takes to do this, you can imagine how do you know the difference between these things? You mostly know it by doing it over and over again, and you develop confidence in being able to say, this is noise and this is signal. But you don't just do, these aren't one-off experiments. These are like decade-off experiments. Um, so, uh, how do I go backwards? Anyway, um, so he basically came up, came up with what he called cognitive map theory where in the uh, place cells are components of a mapping system, uh, which it would presumably be sensitive to single cells. He couldn't map single cells. They respond to stimuli from the immediate environment, um, and they imply an inherent navigational system. Um, so the next group of people, his students, um, did, oh, I think I missed something. How do I go back on this? I have a short interview with this guy. He was in blue, so I couldn't see it. No, I'm not doing it. How do I? That should do it. That should do it. Oh, I had to wait for it to. Ah, oh, there we go. Hello. This is after the Nobel Prize that he's talking about his work. Skip this. It's obviously not hearing it is not going to be informative. Uh, he's a very pleasant gentleman. Okay, moving on. Uh -oh. Okay, now there it is. Oh, there it is. I'll be back. Okay, so. Um, Okay, now moving on to the, uh, the, the Mosers, the married couple who were his postdocs. Um, the, the 
most significant thing they found, and this took them a few years to get to this point, so again, there's a lot of painstaking work. And they're, they're working with uh, much finer equipment. They're able to uh, probe individual cells. And um, they basically were, cons were, were, were interested in how the, the hippo hippocampus is communicating with other parts of, of the brain. And um, so here they're looking at the, uh, the medial lateral cort cortex in the brain. Uh, and this is one of the margins of that. And in particular, the data here, these are data. The, the data here are from three individual cells that are inside this little red dot. So, um, and this is half a millimeter, so obviously this is a very, very small thing. These people are doing this over and over again, so they know where they are. Um, the, uh, the, uh, this, these three uh, labels are for each of the individual cells that they're probing. Um, this shows a um, firing pattern from an individual cell. Uh, this shows a presentation of the grid local to this cell, and this is more of a, like, a weaker magnification, pulled back a little bit. So you can see from looking at individual cells here, they're able to see a grid. Now this, this is established with uh, rats that are freely moving. They have, uh, you know, they've had burr holes drilled in their skulls, and, and electrodes are placed in specific locations and then there's a little cap that's cemented in place so they have a hat on their heads so they're walking around with wires and, and all that um, and um, as I said this is this shows the peak firing rate at the center obviously you know there's there's averages across here and this is a spatial map as I said pulling back from all of this so once again they're seeing uh, think, uh, they're seeing the um, the signal that results from movement but it's in a different part of the brain. It's in the medial entorhinal cortex. <clears throat> so what they, to summarize this whole thing, uh, to cut to the, to the quick on this, uh, they observed that the cells fire in a mosaic pattern, as you saw. Uh, the cells are topographically organized, and they represent the environment the mouse is moving in. They're anchored to external cues, mean, meaning that, that if the uh, mouse wants to know something, that if it goes to where it is, where it wants to know, like say a piece of cheese, then it's going to fire. Um, the structure persists, so it, it learns. Basically, this is memory. Um, the, the grids form quickly. After only one um, exposure, these things can form in the medial entorhinal uh, cortex, which is pretty quick. In the, in the hippocampus, those, those would take repeated, I don't, I don't know how many, but repeated experiments with an animal. So um, their hypothesis then was the grid cells are the basic unit for mapping of the spatial environment. And of course, they also interact with the place cells. So you have the place cells that say where you are, and the grid cells that say where something else is that you might be interested in. And again, unfortunately, we can't probably listen to the, uh, to the YouTube thing, so we'll just skip that. But if you're interested, I can send this stuff around. Okay, but you might be thinking to yourself, I'm not a rat, why should I care? Um, there's some really recent studies, actually just published about two weeks ago, um, that gave data on some human trials, and these are not the first of, these, of this kind. There were some, a couple of publications last year as well. Um, they're recording using fMRI in a virtual environment. So you give, the, give a person the idea that they're someplace, they're actually just sitting in one place, they're in an MRI machine, um, but they're presented with something visually that gives them the representation of having been someplace. So they might go in a room and they have to make a right turn in order to go someplace, and then you get to a wall, whatever it happens to be. Um, and what they discovered, in all, and I'm going to, I'm going to avoid like all the images. The images are hard to look at in some of these papers because they're, they're like photographs of of a virtual image that somebody is looking at, and it's just hard to look at these things. But the bottom line is that once again, you had the entorhinal and, um, and subicular regions of the brain uh, showing a neural representation of where, uh, where the goal is that, going, that you're going to, and that the engagement, that is the communication between hippocampus and um, the entorhinal cortex can vary based on the root that a person, in this, case, in this case, these are humans, are planning the decision they make along the way. Um, but in the end, the, the, the goal, I want to go over there, and the direction in which I'm facing, 
have shared neural representation, <coughs> which is why I would go that way. Otherwise, if the goal is over there and facing this way, I'm not going to go this way. So, uh, and what you, what you missed in the YouTube is Moser is talking about the research in a sort of general way. And he says, well, this is important in, in, in humans too, you know, because the question comes up, why should I care about rats? Um, it's important in humans, and, and he cites the case of Alzheimer's. Um, and uh, another very recent study, this came out in December uh, from Burgess, is looking at uh, behavior in rats and, and, and also even in a possible treatment for this behavior. But um, there, there is a transgenic, if you will, model for Alzheimer's <laughs> in which uh, genes that produce the Alzheimer's plaque are, uh, are uh, put into cells in a, um, in a uh, rat embryo. And when the rat develops, uh, in certain cases, you can get similar plaques in the rat's, rat's brain as you would get in a human with Alzheimer's disease. So that makes it a model system for studying Alzheimer's disease. Obviously, with a model system like that, you can do things with a rat that you can't do with a person. So it's very advantageous. It may not be, everybody knows it's not exactly a person. It is a rat, and it's transgenic. So you're just holding on to that. Still, it's the best you have to work with besides uh, actual human patients. Um, so he's using a transgenic model, meaning it's genetically trans, uh, transformed into something that behaves like Alzheimer's in this, at a cellular level, and also at a behavioral level. I'll show you data for that in a sec. Um, so basically what he's, uh, and he has a system where he's looking at whether uh, a burst of ultrasound uh, that's focused on the dorsal hippocampus um, is able to have any impact on plaque formation. And he notes in his discussion that focused ultrasound is already used, at least experimentally, I don't know if it's used in, in medical treatment, but it's at least used experimentally for drug delivery to the brain. And the idea of it, of it is, that, is that, again, you, you put a burr hole in the cranium and you have to be able to get the ultrasound probe in there. And by putting that, that, uh, that burst of uh, ultrasound, that you can open up the, uh, the, the physical entity of the brain barrier to a certain extent and it will allow things to penetrate. And there are some data in this, um, some data in this paper that, that sort of demonstrate that. Um, uh, so basically he wanted to make sure that the blood-brain barrier is not, is not damaged and, um, you know, it's, it's Again, I don't know what control experiments he did not at all the backgrounds that get up to the level of doing the amount of force that he applied and whatever. But basically, he, um, he had um, his, uh, the, the TG would be the transgenic mice, and these are the normal mice. So these are litter mates. So you can, you can get mice that some of which in a litter would be transgenic and some of which are not. So the, the genetic background is essentially identical. Um, um, so, uh, basically, he could open the blood-brain barrier to the same extent as the bottom line, and we don't really need to get into the details too much because it's going to take too long. But, um, but he was really interested in looking at mouse behavior because these transgenic mice with all of these Alzheimer's plaques uh, would have lesser capability of successfully running in a maze. They get confused just like a, a human with Alzheimer's plaques. Um, and they had two different kinds of maze tests. Uh, if you're interested, you can figure out what they are. But one of them is called a novel arm, and the other one is called maximum alternation. So you can imagine if you have younger siblings what that might be. Um, but um, the transgenic mice were found just in, in control testing to perform worse in these tests. So you already had a, a, a comparison, um, and that would be shown here. And here, in these two different tests, the transgenic ones are not performing as well as the non-transgenic. So these are the ones, again, that have all of the plaques that resemble Alzheimer's disease. When he does his uh, focused electrosound, uh, electro, yeah, uh, ultrasound, um, he, does, he did it with both groups of, of animals. And the mice that were, um, that were transgenic improved considerably. 
Part of the reason for that is they had many fewer plaques. He went on to actually collect cells and count the number of plaques in, a, in the brain, collect more than cells, they looked at the whole brain, and he would count individual plaques in, in the brain. So the alt focus ultrasound was, re was reducing the impact of these plaques to the extent where their animal's behavior was improved. Uh, and here's the thing about the plaque. Um, so the, not only the number of plaques, but the mean size of plaques. There were about, I think, 20 times more plaques per mouse in the uh, transgenic, which were transgenic. Um, whichever one were transgenic than the other ones. Um, uh, transgenic are this way, and these are the, the controls. <coughs> so the focused electrosound re, uh, reduced the, the, the number of the plaque size in both cases, but behavior was improved in the, um, in the transgenic mice. And all of this more or less Eventually, if you follow the trail, it derives from the work that was done in 1971, published in 1971, uh, first started a few years ago with fits and starts as people, you know, get their head wrapped around what they want to do and get their systems going. And here it extends all the way until a paper that came out last month in which um, people are, are identifying <coughs> and using the principle of um, location of certain kinds of place cells and extending that to um, to the question what does what impact does this have on brain function the brain physiology and what can I even possibly do as a treatment so um, I, I suggest that since nobody here else could see these videos you might be interested in them it's really it's really kind of interesting to get the backstory from people and they're each about two minutes so if you want, I can send you the uh, URLs or something like that. But I think that is the end. That is the end of the story. So, any questions or comments? It's interesting for the anatomy that uh, how you know the proximity of the uh, hippocampus to the entorhinal cortex and then the uh, its association with the um, olfaction. And why that's why they say smell, you know, provokes such you know, significant memories. Because mm -hmm. it's all right in that same region, you know? So the smell input goes to the, you know, hippocampus, which is really proximal to the parietal cortex. Mm -hmm. And then you get all your memories back and so on. Right, right, yeah, there were some papers on, on, on uh, smell and also on sight. Um, you don't, don't need papers, papers, just watch Ratatouille. <laughs> <laughs> and that guy really smells his... <laughs> 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 but the, the question that I have, and, and which we've been struggling with, you know, I don't know if you guys are aware that we have the Center for Cognition and Ethics, and the, the whole concept of free will is that these are all patterns of electricity. At what point does it turn into consciousness? You know, where, what, and how does that work? We have no clue. It's just basically a bunch of chemicals and electricity, and we're sitting here talking. You know, it right. means... No one's made the leap as to what, what is going on that all of a sudden we're conscious and aware. So is it a facade? Like, are we just like, this is just robotic, I'm just here. I was supposed to be here a billion years ago, now I'm doing this. Um, I don't know. It, that doesn't intuitively make sense to me. Right? So it seems like we do have free will, but where does that get translated into that? You know? Right, right. Well, I think, uh, you know, we wind up answering the questions that we can, you know, having to develop model systems when, when there are things that are inviolate, like we can't do certain things with humans. Mm -hmm. um, and even if we could, could we even answer this question? I don't know, right. that, I don't know that that would be possible. Right. You know, right. if, we're, if we're looking at something mechanistic, like what is a cell doing, and then something that's consciousness that, you know, I, mean, I don't even know how well defined that is in a yeah. physical sense. Right. Um, certainly, you know, different neurons fire when somebody is thinking about different things, and obviously different senses. Right. But what does that really tell us? It, it's, right. it's, I mean, I, I sort of feel like this whole is greater than the sum of the parts kind of things. And, and, and what an individual cell tells us is fine, but it's, it's the whole thing, yeah. the whole thing in operation. Yeah. At a practical level, this is why I think patients that are in a familiar setting, once they get a brain injury and go back home, they do better.
than when they're in the hospital. You know, they don't see their surroundings, they're confused. They go home, all of a sudden they start to feel a lot better. Mm -hmm. They know what's, what's happening around, it's the same familiar uh, surroundings and so on. I have a question. What would the process be to be able to take this from a, an animal study to a human study in someone with Alzheimer's? Like, would it have to be as extreme to, to have people sign up for this project before they um, were not cognitively impaired in order to be, you know, for me to say, you know, if I end up getting diagnosed with Alzheimer's and 40 mm -hmm. years or something like that, I want to be a part of this study so that I'm intact, you know, and I'm making a decision now. What would yeah, it take? Yeah, well, the, the first thing would happen after, typically after an animal study like this, after it's been repeated enough so that people are confident that this is the outcome, is that they wouldn't work with patients right away. They would work with, with human volunteers and it would take some period of time, of normal people, that is, people who didn't have this, this issue. But there are some, some circumstances where you can go direct to patients, but um, I, I, Alzheimer's is not a rare condition, and it, it's, it's almost like a chronic, I mean, it's a chronic disease. Once you get it, it's basically it. And it happens with such high frequency that you know, there's no shortage of uh, volunteers or, or potential subjects or, or customers if you're a company that come up, comes up with a device. Um, but typically, the, they, they, uh, the next step after animal trials is you want to demonstrate the safety of something. So you, you would have to, you would do that with non-Alzheimer's patients because they would be able uh, at least to report the results of what's going on, they, their experience more lucidly. Um, that probably wouldn't have to be a very large number of people, you know, 20, 30 people, something like that. Um, and at that, once, once safety is demonstrated, you could go directly to doing a comparative study similar to this, I would think, okay. where you would take Alzheimer's patients and non-Alzheimer's patients. Um, maybe, you're, maybe you're talking about more serious disease. I don't know. There'd have to be some way of saying where along the path of development of Alzheimer's disease. At some point, people are less likely to respond. At some point much earlier than that, maybe the disease is not serious enough, mm -hmm. but perhaps there's some fluidity at that early point. Maybe you can catch somebody when they just have the early stage of some sort of cognitive dissonance, if you will. Mm -hmm. and, but it, it would need to be severe enough that you could see a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also, it would also be an issue of like, how do you, how do you cover sufficient area in the brain, you know, these these uh, rats and mice have tiny brains compared to us. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be another issue. You don't want to make sure that you're targeting the right area because you're doing the the ultrasound is focused. I don't know to what extent you can move it around if you have to take a large, you know, skull <coughs> bar or whatever. <coughs> it, it certainly, you know, it, it could be mapped out. It could be done. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody would had that in mind. Um, to what you know, to what expense? Mm -hmm. but I think this that, but that kind of thing is worth doing to know if it can be done, because then you can start to think about you know something. You know, maybe ultrasound is too dramatic. Maybe there's something else that, that is you know less invasive than removing a skull cap. But you know, there are craniotomies every day, so isn't that? Uncommon. Mm -hmm. So it would be a, it would be a very interesting thing to see. Mm -hmm. <coughs> when you were uh, looking into all the background on this, did you run across anything about uh, MS and ultrasound? Because you know, I, I'd see you know it's a pretty similar process. You know, you're forming plaques on both central nervous and peripheral nervous system structures. So it seems like you'd, like you'd be much more able to focus ultrasound on you know a nerve in the arm than you would in the brain without being mm -hmm. so invasive. About that's it. A, yeah, that's an excellent point. You, that and that might be actually a good test system. I I have not seen anything on that. It, uh, MS is, is a fairly frequent condition, not mm -hmm. as, as much as Alzheimer's. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm sure that you know there, there are advocates for ultrasound. <coughs> there have got to be, at least the people who make them. I mean, certainly one of the questions with something like that is how focused is the focused ultrasound? I mean, because obviously you're talking about displacement of air or some other fluid material because you're moving something in space. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, you, you can only displace, depending on the amplitude of that signal, you can only focus, you know, based on amplitude and frequency. So that would that would make a difference in, in the effectiveness of I presume the treatment. Do you have you seen any MS patients? Oh, have I seen patients? Or? I mean people with MS. Have you had people with MS? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting to get get their story. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. A field like this is so broad. You know, getting into it is it's it really opens up the door for more potential. Oh, it's, it does seem to. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you know, people are still trying to figure out how the how this how this organ works. Mm -hmm. Most of the other ones in our bodies have been have been figured out, and we can deal with them more mm -hmm. or less. Um, so it yeah, it's. It's hard to think about how how you know we could even access the brain in order to do that. And you know, it's everything gets dramatic and expensive and and, and rare to treat because there are a few people capable of doing the work. Mm -hmm. So you can't just you couldn't it, it wouldn't be like you know immunization for anything. Mm -hmm. But. Um, I don't know. It, always, it, it, it does make me think, though, when I walk someplace, you know, have I gotten to another point of grid? <laughs> I'm in the matrix. But uh, look out for Keanu Reeves. I mean, he might be in this. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for coming.